Tonight on Nation to Nation, it's a minority liberal government. And that may mean good news for Indigenous people, as the Liberals need to make deals to stay in power. I think this is the perfect situation. Uh, don't, don't forget, uh, it was a Liberal minority with New Democrats uh, in opposition that got Medicare and CPP in Canada. But it appears Trudeau is first appealing to the Conservatives. Trudeau said tax cuts and Trans Mountain Pipeline our priorities. It seemed to be sort of a gift to a region of Canada that did not support him at all, really. At a post-election press conference, the Prime Minister defends his record on Indigenous issues. We have moved forward in a meaningful way on a broad range of issues uh, and local successes across the country on reconciliation. Hello, I'm Todd Lamoran and welcome to Nation to Nation. The federal election is over. Ten Indigenous people were elected as members of Parliament. The same as in 2015. One of them is 24-year-old Mamoun Milak Kokkok, who won for the NDP in Nunavut. How excited was her home community of Baker Lake? Well, they held an impromptu parade for her. Here's some video of that. Now that it's over, what does the future hold? After all, the Liberals now have a minority government. That means to pass any bills or stay in power, Justin Trudeau needs the help of other parties. The NDP or Bloc are the most likely targets to prop up this government. But could Trudeau also look to the Conservatives, the official opposition? Likely not on much, but there's one major issue where they might have to. Here's Trudeau speaking to reporters Wednesday in Ottawa. We made the decision to move forward on the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion because it was in Canada's uh, interest to do so, because the environment and the economy need to go together. We will be continuing uh, with the Trans Mountain Pipeline expansion. If the courts finally clear the expansion, Trudeau could need the Conservatives, because both the NDP and Greens want to kill the pipeline. But there are many issues this government faces going forward. Here to discuss that, is Veldon Colburn, Assistant Professor of Indigenous Studies at the University of Ottawa, and Carolyn O'Neill, a morning journalist with Ottawa's Indigenous radio station, 95.7 Element FM. Thank you for coming on Nation to Nation again. It's good to be here, Todd. Uh, Mr. Colburn, I'm going to start with you. Were you surprised to see Trudeau get in with just a minority government? I don't think I was terribly surprised. I think a lot of the speculation, especially from a lot of the political pundits and, um, and pollsters during the campaign period and even leading up to it, was the trend was that he had lost the support needed to uh, maintain and sustain his majority government and the, the number of seats. There had been some resistance and, uh, and I guess some distaste for his particular government, but I, I mean that's sort of par for the course, right? I don't know how many times in Canadian history that people have warmed up or at least amplified a sitting government. So. Um, in some regions, they started almost from perfect, like Atlantic Canada, where they had won all the seats before, because you can only really go down from there. So um, I think it was kind of a toss-up between uh, a minority government for either the Conservative Party or the Liberals. Uh, he is going to, as I said in my introduction, is going to need some other some help. Um, do you think that he's flexible enough to uh, accede to any demands that might come from the other parties to pass legislation? Well, I don't know exactly what's in his legislative agenda, but some of the projects that he has going forward that he's almost already announced yesterday, in fact, was the uh, tax cuts and, um, and putting through the Trans Mountain Pipeline, that that was going to be built. And it seemed to be sort of a gift to a region of Canada that did not support him at all, really, is uh, almost, um, al almost like two-thirds of Alberta voted for Conservatives and they did not win a single seat there and they did not win a single seat in, in Saskatchewan so um, it seemed to be sort of a gift to that particular region that was hostile towards his government um, so I don't see and this being something that's preferred by the the Conservative government is that uh, this was a project that they want to see through. Uh, Ms. O'Neill I'll get your thoughts on this um, uh, do you kind of agree with uh, Mr. Colburn or do you, do you think something differently? No, I do agree. I think that, I think given the way the election turned out, he is going to be looking for support in some very different places. And 
from the speech that he gave at the National Theatre, I think he was really trying to see what kind of support he'll be getting. He did mention Western Canada, saying that he he knows that there are parts of the country that are unhappy, and he said that he hears them, right? And I think that now he's trying to signal that he will be backing that up with some form of action. But I do think it's going to be a long road ahead because he might get support from the Conservatives on something like the Trans Mountain Pipeline. But what would that mean then if he were to go to the NDP for support when it comes to a different matter on the agenda? Well, let's uh, to pick up on that. Uh, for example, the NDP would like to see them drop this case against the Human Rights Tribunal, uh, which ordered compensation. And then, of course, during the election campaign, they said they were going to, or at least the, you got the lawyers to, uh, they want to put aside or, or have it go away. So the NDP and the Greens said, well, you can't do that. I mean, what does he do in that situation? You know, I think the smart thing to do would be to work with the NDP and with the Green Party on that, because for any any issue that relates to the reconciliation mandate or an Indigenous mandate, that's where he will be getting that support. And I think that he needs to show, like he said in his speech, that he's willing to compromise and he's willing to cooperate against party lines. And sometimes cooperating does mean taking a look at some of your policies or what you said you were going to do during an election period and see if there is a way to do it differently. Though he didn't seem to compromise much when it came to the issue of Jody Wilson-Raybould and SNC Lavalin. That's right, yeah. But getting to the point of, of Indigenous children and the decision that came out in early September uh, from the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal, is, is that still, I think, a thorn in the side of a lot of Indigenous peoples and populations? I mean, this is our younger generation, and it is a generation that should or possibly grow up with and come of age during reconciliation. Now, they might start them off further back behind the starting line and um, but again in terms of social uh, policy they may have to turn towards the perhaps the two more progressive parties that have considerable seats so the Bloc Québécois um, despite their sort of nationalist sovereignist uh, policies as they are quite progressive in social policy but also the NDP where um, Jagmeet Singh, Singh said unequivocally is that suing Indigenous children mm -hmm. is not an option uh, and another, when you talk about things that kind of upset some, certainly some Indigenous people out in British comedy, is the whole pipeline thing. And uh, uh, I don't know if uh, Shear could have done anything differently, because we're talking about uh, right now it's in federal court. That's the only thing that's really holding this up right now. Mm -hmm. um, is, is that the biggest obstacle right now, or is he going to listen to some of the Indigenous people out there that uh, don't want it? Well, it seemed like the tone, or at least the approach, um, and how he's embracing Indigenous people is far more moderated this time than it was four years ago in 2015, where he mentioned it was going to be nation to nation, and it was the most important relationship. And, and we heard that quite often through several years. Now this time, in his, his, uh, his sort of speech on election night, Justin Trudeau mentions like, well, you know, let's make reconciliation a priority. And that was really the only sort of gesture towards Indigenous people that, and you know, it, it comes on the heels of, again, these decisions and even the, the statement yesterday that they're going to push through Trans Mountain. Now there is some uh, resistance and opposition to it from several First Nations along the Trans Mountain corridor. So uh, it seems like it, he's willing to ruffle some feathers, especially to appease to um, Western Canada. Uh, uh, Ms. O'Neill talking again about reconciliation, uh, he was asked about that during his press conference on Wednesday. Uh, and he started to list off the, uh, the accomplishments, I suppose, of the Liberal government. Uh, uh, did he do enough? Um, and what does he need to do, I guess, to further reconciliation? First of all, I think it was a pleasure to actually hear a leader talk about something they did as opposed to what other people are doing that they didn't like. But I don't think they did enough. And again, you know, I think that the way that he spoke about reconciliation four years ago was very hopeful. And there was a sense that there was, they were willing to put the work in. And I think when you look now, four years later, it seems like perhaps they weren't willing to put the work in all the way. And especially during the election period as well, reconciliation did not come up a lot during the campaign. And he was on the campaign trail for 40 days. And that does make me wonder what vote it was that he was actually interested in courting during the election period. Was it a progressive voter? Or was he maybe interested more in courting perhaps moderate conservatives who weren't interested in Andrew Scheer as a leader? And uh, can the NDP, uh, I suppose, use uh, indigenous issues if, if uh, the Liberals do go to them to prop up their government, uh, use that to, to further reconciliation, to further indigenous issues? 
I hope they do. And I think, again, reconciliation has to be across all party lines. And I think that was really the downfall in the last parliamentary session. It seemed like people were really only interested in reconciliation if it came specifically from their party under their mandate and under their agenda. But that can't be the case going forward. And Jagmeet Singh, I think, came out the strongest for Indigenous issues during this election period. He talked about things like water. He talked about things like the Human Rights Tribunal. And even in the debate, he was the one who brought the Indigenous Issues section back to Indigenous Issues when it turned into an environmental conversation. So I think that if any party is poised to lead the agenda on Indigenous Issues, I do think it would be the NDP. Uh, Mr. Coburn, I guess to kind of follow up on that, where does that leave the Green Party in all this? Oh, well, uh, with three seats, I don't know, they may s still play a minor role, but they do have kind of a prominent place in the public consciousness as well. So. Um, environmental issues uh, very close to home for a lot of Indigenous peoples, especially the um, issues of environmental contaminants, but climate change itself rapidly changing the north much faster than it is the south, um, and um, that being the home to, again, you know, the largest riding, which is predominantly uh, Inuit, and they're sending in an NDP MP for the first time. Um, it may leave them still at the margins in parliaments and still on the margins of indigenous issues as well. So I think um, just what Carolyn said is that um, Jagmeet Singh and the NDP may be the closest to home for indigenous peoples in terms of their issues and bringing this uh, into the forefront in parliament. Uh, do you think um, the, to, to stay with Nunavut, uh, was that um you think the millennial vote uh, raising its voice there? Well, it's a young, young demographic, a really young demographic, right? And um, they've developed a capacity for themselves. We're 20 years out of the Nunavut uh, modern treaty, their modern land claims of establishing themselves. And they are de facto pretty much uh, uh, an in indigenous population. About 85% of Nunavut is, is Inuk, right? So um, young Inuk. Uh, developing capacity and probably no longer uh, allowing outsiders to represent themselves so um, it could be millennial Inuit that have sent uh, one of their own to Parliament to start speaking on their behalf. Right, well it's going to be interesting. Uh, Ms. O'Neill I'll give you the final question uh, since we started with Mr. Coburn today. Uh, we got two ministers for Indigenous Relations. Uh, what sentiment among Indigenous people is there now to, to the these potentially two people now that the election is over. I'll be interested to see what the sentiment is. You know, somebody like Seamus O'Regan won his writing very handily, but I would say that he also had very tough shoes to fill, right? He came after Jane Philpott and the way that he approached Indigenous issues were different. He was there during a pressing time, but there were also some very valid critiques of the way he handled things. And I think with Carolyn Bennett coming back, they are missing a key player, except she'll be across the aisle from them, right? They did most of their work in tandem with Jody Wilson-Raybould, they don't have her now, and I'll be very interested to see the work that they do moving forward. But I don't think people may have the same hope in those players that they did four years ago, and I think that they're both going to have to work incredibly hard to build trust up again. Uh, uh, just uh, quickly, uh, Carolyn Bennett, she's been there for four years. Does she come back to um, that portfolio? You know, I'm interested to see that, right, because she had been there for four years. Um, as a doctor, you could send her over to health, for instance. That could be a place for her to go. But I'm also trying to think about who are some of the other players that were elected that could be very effective in that role. So I think we know that the Prime Minister is having meetings right now, and I think he's probably starting to shore that up. Okay, well, thank you uh, again for your insight. It's been great having you here. Thank you for being on Nation to Nation. Thanks, Thanks for having us. After the break, we speak to Leah Gazan, the new NDP MP for Winnipeg Centre. Welcome back. One of the new faces coming to Ottawa is Leah Gazan. She's Lakota, a longtime educator and activist, especially on human rights issues, and she's now an NDP member of Parliament. <laughs> Having defeated Liberal incumbent Robert Falcon led in the election on Monday. She joins me now from Winnipeg. First of all, Ms. Gazan, Congratulations, and welcome to Nation to Nation. Thank you, Todd. First question is, uh, what will be your pri priority soon after taking your seat here in Ottawa? Well, I've met with a lot of the local uh, organizations uh, throughout my campaign nomination race. I want to push for that community-led, community-centered vision, um, as well as uh, climate. 
Uh, we currently are in a climate emergency. Um, I plan on pushing a very bold uh, climate justice agenda. I was really proud to have the support of Our Time Campaign Lead Now and, um, of course, Naomi Klein, uh, who um, recommended me and, and endorsed me as the uh, climate champion. Uh, I will stay true to that, and I'm looking forward to pushing a bold climate agenda. Uh, you mentioned that, and you also said after first getting elected that your focus is on social and climate justice and human rights. How do you expect to push that from the opposition benches, albeit there is a liberal minority now? Well, I think this is the perfect situation. Uh, don't, don't forget, Todd, uh, it was a liberal minority with New Democrats uh, in opposition that got Medicare and CPP in Canada. I think we're in a perfect position uh, to push forward a bold agenda, particularly around uh, human rights. I think it's critical. What would you like to see your leader, Jagmeet Singh, do for Indigenous people if the Liberals do come looking for support? Well, I think uh, it's actually the opposite, Todd. I mean, the, the current Liberal government is on their eighth non-compliance order to immediately racially, to stop racially discriminating against First Nations kids. They found a way to, out of the hat, uh, get $4.5 billion to buy a 50-year-old leaky pipeline. Uh, certainly, they could show the same political will to stop violating the fundamental human rights of, of little kids. I certainly will push that, and I know our party has indicated that they are very clear on the stance that we must always abide by the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal ruling. I'm looking forward to working with uh, Mr. Singh uh, to push that forward. Uh, so I guess what you're saying is uh, if the Liberals uh, want support for any piece of legislation from the NDP, they've got to drop this uh, review judicial review of the human rights. Well, I think, I think really, I think it's a, a, it has been a stalling tactic. Uh, I'm also really excited to support any government bill, uh, much like Bill C-262, to see the full adoption and implementation of UNDRIP, and more so, uh, even more so than that, uh, to have something like that to frame policies and operational practices so going forward, governments like the Liberal governments can't just willfully disregard a Canadian Human Rights Tribunal ruling when it, when it relates to the fundamental human rights of Indigenous children. Uh, of course, you just mentioned UNDRIP. You were here actually on our set at Nation to Nation about 18 months ago. Uh, when you expressed confidence, confidence that UNDRIP would get passed, uh, it didn't, of course. Uh, so how soon would you like to see a government-sponsored bill this time go through Parliament? Well, I think it was unfortunate that the Liberals spent two and a half years stalling the bill uh, before it reached Senate, uh, killed by five unelected, undemocratic and unaccountable senators. I'm hoping that, you know, certain the Liberals uh, once again have committed uh, to pushing this forward. I'm hoping that it happens immediately and certainly that's something that I would really support and push along with millions of Canadians across the country who wanted the bill to begin with. Your writing, of course, does have its share of problems. Your predecessor was on here to talk about the meth cri crisis. How do you foresee helping your constituents deal with that? Well, I don't think it's a meth crisis. In fact, I think it's a poverty human rights crisis with not enough mental health drama supports. I plan on working with uh, local uh, community organizations, uh, families and impacted persons, like I have been doing uh, along this journey uh, to find uh, solutions. I don't think we lack the ideas and uh, responses in this community. What we do lack is resources, and I think I will be pushing the government to do things like divest from the $3.3 billion they spend on the fossil fuel industry and invest in the good people of Winnipeg Centre. Government is about choices, and I'm going to push for choices that focus on people and human rights rather than corporate welfare. You also now represent a large immigrant population there in Winnipeg Centre. For example, there's some 14,000, 15,000 Filipinos. What would you say are their top concerns, and how are you going to meet them? Well, certainly uh, one of the uh, areas we're looking at is adjusting the family uh, reunification uh, program so that it's fairer and also looking at credentialing. There's many people that come from around the world, uh, come to Winnipeg, uh, doctors, nurses, uh, teachers, 
it's time that we look at the credentials of people coming from around the world and recognize their prior education and training um, and get them involved uh, in the workforce. I think we've kind of gone beyond the time where we should disregard people's knowledge and education. We must respect what people bring to this country. Well, Ms. Gizan, I, I'm assuming uh, you'll be getting here soon, uh, finding a place to live and uh, settling in. Uh, once again, I want to thank you for speaking to me. Yeah, thank you so much, Todd. Another break, and we'll have more from Trudeau's post-election press conference. Welcome back. Earlier in the show, we played you a short clip from a press conference Trudeau held on Wednesday. Most of the 30-minute question and answer with reporters dealt with issues like Western separatism and how he had worked with the leaders of the other parties in a minority government. But he was asked about the overrepresentation of Indigenous people behind bars. We recognize uh, that incarceration rates are unacceptable for Indigenous peoples. Uh, there is not a single easy answer. The answers uh, involve investments with communities and things like housing in terms of uh, mental health and medical health, medical supports, addictions treatments, uh, but also education, um, opportunities, infrastructure, economic development. There are many, many factors that go into this, but there's also a need to look carefully at our justice system and uh, look at how we can improve our justice system so that we are not uh, further criminalizing and penalizing specific portions of the population. Work has to be done on reconciliation, but also touted what his government has done in the past four years. I am impatient as well. Uh, about closing the gaps, about moving forward uh, on economic opportunities, on better uh, support and uh, Indigenous-led uh, systems of support for their communities. Uh, but I recognize at the same time uh, that we have taken significant steps, whether it was 87 long-term boil water advisories lifted and we're on track to eliminating all of them. We have closed the funding gap. We have reached parity on education uh, in K-12 to uh, for Indigenous communities. We have moved forward in a meaningful way on a broad range of issues uh, and local successes across the country on reconciliation, but there is much more to do. Trudeau was also pleased with the outcome of a meeting Wednesday morning with Inuit Tapri Kanatami President Natan Obed and Assembly of First Nations National Chief Perry Bellegarde. Who uh, highlighted again how uh, pleased he was that this past government uh, has done more for Indigenous Canadians and Indigenous communities and any government in history, but that we need to keep working and do even more, and I entirely agree. And that is going to be my focus uh, on Indigenous relations, because no relationship is more important to me than the one with Canada's Indigenous peoples. No relationship more important. Well, we've certainly heard that a lot before. But that's going to wrap it up this week. If you missed any part of tonight's show or any others, you can check out our podcast. Go to aptnnews.ca slash podcast. Next week, we'll have a couple of fierce critics of Trudeau's past agenda. I'm Todd Lamoran. Thanks for watching.